because of course that makes sense. It should make sense. Hopefully you can't get up in there unless the membranes are ruptured. So a rupture of membranes has to occur. What if she's just be bopping around the hall and her water, she looks down and her water has broken and it's all over the floor. What do you do as the nurse? You say, what's her back in bed? So get back in bed, right? And we're checking to see if the baby has done what? Engaged because remember, has to be engaged, it has to be locked in in order for them to be walking, able to walk. If you if you go back to the room and you check her and she's locked in, then you, she can get back up and be bop around some more if she wants to, because now we're not worried about that umbilical cord dropping below the presenting part. Correct? All right. All right, so we've hooked her up to the monitor, and now we're going to talk about this electronic fetal monitoring, the things that we're looking for, okay? Now, there are what we call periodic changes on the monitor, periodic and episodic changes, okay? Periodic and episodic changes. Periodic changes are those that occur with a contraction. Those that occur with a contraction. And those are okay. There's nothing wrong with those. We won't, remember what I said yesterday, that the contraction is a stressful experience, not only for the mother, but for that baby. So even though the fetal heart rate should be between what? <coughs> 110 and 160, okay? Even though it may increase, okay, with a contraction, as long as it goes back down, it's okay because it's a stressful response. Now, episodic changes, episodic changes are changes that occur that are not associated with a contraction. Those are changes such as the baby is just flipping and flopping. Okay, you can actually see that on the monitor. You can actually see the heart rate rise and fall if the baby is flipping and turning. Okay, but it could also mean something ominous. It could be that the, the heart rate is dropping because the baby's not getting enough perfusion. Maybe it's settled down on the umbilical cord and it's not getting any oxygen. And so we're going to see the heart rate start to go down. Again, that had nothing to do with the contraction. It's just the way the baby is laying. So those are called episodic changes. Do you understand the difference? So a periodic change in the fetal heart rate or in the strip that you're looking at occurs when the contraction is occurring. An episodic change occurs any other time. Anything else is going on. Are with me? All right. Now, when you're looking at a fetal heart or a strip, a printout, you're going to have two lines. Okay? The top line is going to be the baseline fetal heart rate. Now, it may go up and down on the baseline, but the line that you see is the fetal heart rate baseline. So what it's doing, what the machine is doing, is it's taking an average, the number that you see is an average of all these squiggly lines, okay? So for example, this fetal heart rate <coughs> might be 120. Well, we know that on occasion it may go up to 140 or it may dip down to 110, but on average it stays around 120. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. The bottom printout on the strip is a contraction pattern. So you're going to see rises and falls, those little mountains, okay, that 
are occurring. These are your contractions. And that's where we talked about the dia, the duration, the intensity, and the frequency. Okay, so you've got these two, two different things that are on your printout. Now, when you're describing what you're seeing to someone, we describe it in two different ways. We say there are accelerations in the fetal heart rate, or there are decelerations. Okay. Now, everybody should know what that means. Accelerations means that they go up, that heart rate's gone up. Decelerations means that it's decelerating. Now, this is where I want you to get, I want you to really pay attention, because we, we further describe them according to where they are located with the contractions. Okay, now I'm going to draw out a couple of different things. So you, if you have a blank sheet of paper or an area you want to... Okay. The way that you remember what I'm getting ready to show you is with the mnemonic feel top. Okay, so right, feel and then chop. First thing that we're going to talk about are variable, variable So remember, various means at different points, right? Various, think about that at different points. So the heart rate, you see a dip in the heart rate at various times with the contraction, okay? Now, the way that you would know that it's a variable is that those are very pointed and that you see how these look like a V or a really tight U? You see that? So that it's very pointed. What that's telling me is that the heart rate might dip down, but it comes returns really quickly. As opposed to a deceleration that might look like this. Okay? See that? That takes a long time for that heart rate to come back up. In this instance, it goes down, but it comes up pretty quickly. It comes right back up, which is a good thing, right? Variable decelerations are due to cord compression. That's your C. What that's telling me is that as the baby is flipping and flopping around, it is pinching off that umbilical cord. As he's sinking down into the birth canal, it, that umbilical cord might get pinched up against the pelvis, or it may get caught between his little legs, but he moves again and it comes right back up because the, the blood flows return. These are typically benign. They're not anything that we get overly concerned about, 
except that if you see them in succession, if you see them over and over and over and over again, then you want to go in the room and have that mother flip around, turn, okay, so that she can get the baby turned. So if you see an extended period of variable deceleration, we want to get her to flip around, move around, turn on her side, turn on her other side, whatever. To get those fixed. Okay. Yep. So far so good? Alright. The next one are called early decelerations early decelerations. Early decelerations when you're looking at the fetal heart rate. <laughs> they always, those decelerations always come before a contraction. Always. Okay. And they're a little bit more prolonged. They're a little bit more prolonged. So they are early in the contraction. There's a little picture that you should have in your PowerPoint somewhere. I think I put it in there. That says it's okay to be early to dinner, but it's not okay to be late. Okay. And we're going to talk about late in just a minute. So it's okay to be early. So again, this is like our variable. It's typically benign, and it's explained by this is a head compression problem. So when are you going to see these more? When the baby's engaged. After the baby's engaged, and that he's trying to get down the birth canal, that little head's just being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. Remember, it's molding and changing and shape, trying to get to that birth canal. So his head's being compressed. So again, it's okay. they're okay. We don't, they're not great because any drop in a, ba in a baby's heart rate is not good, but we can explain it away. We can say, well, it's due to the fact that this mother's in active labor, the baby's head's been squeezed. It, they will resolve themselves eventually. Okay? The next thing in our build chart are accelerations. Accelerations. And any time you see an acceleration, those are okay. Again, those are typically due to that baby moving around, or that mother had too much caffeine to drink, or cocaine, <laughs> or whatever, but it's jacked up the heart rate. Okay, so if you look at your monitor, you're going to see these. Those are accelerations. So it's off the baseline, and they've gone up. Okay. And accelerations in your build chop, accelerations are okay. They're flipping and flopping, they're moving, they go up. And, and if you think about an acceleration, the reason they're okay, think about yourself. If you started right here and you took off running around the hall and you stopped, what's going to happen to your heart rate? It's have gone up, right, because you've exercised, and then it'll come back down slowly. And that's the same thing that's happening to this baby. He's, he's exercising, he's moving Doing around and kicking right. and everything, and his heart rate went up, but it came right back down. The last one is the one that is the most ominous. These are called late decelerations. Late decelerations. Okay? And if you look at these, On the monitor. Okay. These are decelerations that are late in the contraction. All right. What that's telling me is that the stressful response has already occurred. Stressful response has already occurred, and that baby did not recover. That baby did not recover. So the, the heart rate is still low. It's still after the contraction. Those are called late decelerations. Late decelerations. 
and the P for that stands for placental perfusion. Okay, something's wrong. Something is wrong. It means that the placenta is not getting enough oxygen or blood supply to, to make that baby okay. It could be a nuchal cord. It could be a true knot in a cord. It could be um, an abruption. Whatever, but that baby's not getting enough oxygen and it's not feeling good. And so your response in this situation is to put oxygen on that mother, make sure she's on her left side because the left side, if you turn on her left side, she's getting the most blood flow and get her into the cavity section. She is going to need to deliver that baby. You've got to get it out. Okay? Those are very ominous in nature. questions we have so far. Clear to Thank you. Right. Exactly. The contraction's over and it still looks like it's stressed and there's no stress going on. Except we do know there's stress going on because we know that the late response to that. Alright, what I want to do is get the that is coming before the contraction. So what I want to do is pass around some examples of real life strips. And as I'm passing them, I'm going to tell you what is going on in this strip. And I want you to see if you can figure out or if you can see some of these things. You can see the earlies or the variables or lates or whatever. Okay? So the first one that I'm going to send around is a term pregnancy. She is a normal pregnancy. It's term. The, the reason that I want to pass this one around is because she had a, she had oxytocin. She has a tocin induction. And what happened with her, there's variables on here. You can see the heart rate dropping down a little bit. But what I really want you to see, and I've circled it in red so that you can see it, is that when the Pitocin got started, her contractions, and they started it, they said at 21 minutes, they, her contractions started coming too close together. Okay, and that is very dangerous. And you can see that this fetal heart rate went way up. It was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Okay, and so they ended up having to stop it again because those contractions, if you don't have a resting period between contractions, that uterus can rupture. So you want it to you want to have a resting period, and that's it did not occur here. So I just wanted to show you what that looks like on, on the strip. I'm just going to kind of alternate these two. The next one I'm going to send around is a example of a 40 week pregnancy. This was an uneventful course of pregnancy. The baby is transverse, a transverse lie. So what does that mean if it was a transverse lie? It was lying sideways, didn't need a shoulder presentation, okay? Um, this one has some accelerations and a couple of variables. What I do want to tell you about this one, though, is that the baby, this patient went to have a C-section. And, and I've got on here, I've got a really good variable right here. This is a very good B and some examples of acelerations. They took this patient to um, have a C-section. And while they were having a C-section, the, the doctor accidentally pinched off the, the umbilical cord. And what you can see is that the fetal heart rate was totally lost. So that's how sensitive that umbilical cord is. There's not any reading at all gone like there was no nothing. So it's very sensitive. Okay. All right, the next one I'm going to show is a picture of a stillbirth. Um, this woman was 39 weeks. It was an uneventful prenatal course. Um, they had the baby had decreased fetal movement and that's why she came in. Um, 
this baby This baby suffered a true knot in the cord. A true knot in the cord. Those are very, very rare. I don't know if you talked about that with Ms. Walker. Did y'all talk about true knots? Did she show you that photo that I had? She passed around the picture. I have a picture of someone who gave me a, like the picture of their baby with it had a true knot. I'll try to find it at break. But um, a true knot in the cord is very rare because when it's free floating around in the in the um, umbilical sac, that cord is floating around in the water, and it so it doesn't get knotted, actually knotted. But what happens is, is that when the water breaks and that baby starts to descend, if there is a knot in the cord, it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, and there is nothing you can do to save those babies. So you may have a woman who went 40 weeks during pregnancy and lose the baby at birth. And there's nothing you can do. You can't see them on ultrasound. You can't prevent that from occurring. Only way that you can actually prevent it is if you were actually doing C-section and you just happened, it just happened to have a true knot. But if that woman is a vaginal delivery, and that's, those are sad situations, if it's a vaginal delivery and that baby is dropping in the birth canal, it's just like a moose. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's a very, very sad situation. And that's what happened with this baby is that she came in because she was in labor and the baby stopped moving. And so you see that she's not having really significant contractions, but there's no variability on the heart rate here at all. Okay, so the, the heart rate is just essentially just a straight line. Um, and what this says, the note says, is the fetus suffered from a true knot in the cord and died late, later in labor. Presumably, prompt C-section would have prevented the later stillbirth, but it is highly unlikely that the infant would have survived the neonatal period and even less likely that it would have survived intact. Um, so, very sad situation. That one. Um, this one is a twin. Um, printout, so there's A and B, so you'll see both. Um, the thing I wanted you to see with this one is that there is a really significant weight deceleration that lasts for a very long period of time. Um, these did not adversely affect the babies. They actually were okay, but, um, and it really doesn't even say, oh, the epidural caused it. The epidural caused this late deceleration. So I just wanted you to see those. This one's probably, this one's just as sad as the other one. Um, I'm get, one of the things that I need to, apparently, that I need to talk to you guys about is, is RH incompatibility. Y'all didn't really talk about that much. Okay. So we're going to talk about RH incompatibility. But what I do want to tell you real quick before, um, and we'll talk about the whole thing later, is that the thing with RH incompatibility is that if you are a, if you are a negative blood type, and you have a baby that is positive, the, the body forms antibodies. It, it recognizes it as a bad thing. It says, this is foreign, this is, they're not compatible, a negative and a positive blood type. The problem is, is that you don't know that until that baby is born. You know your blood type, right? They draw your blood in prenatal assessment. So if you are a negative blood type, what do you get? You get Rogam. Did she talk to you about Rogam? Okay, so you get a shot of Rogam. What Rogam does is it tricks the body into thinking that they have the same blood type as that baby. Okay. Now, when that baby's born, that baby might be negative itself, and then you got the Rogam and you really didn't need it. But we don't know that yet, right? It's not going to hurt you. But if it was that the baby is positive, that it tricks the body into thinking, oh, it's okay. The problem occurs when these women don't get prenatal care, okay, or they have a, a miscarriage, a late miscarriage, and did not go to the doctor, 
because the first pregnancy, if that baby is born, that first pregnancy is okay. But if that woman tried to get pregnant again, those antibodies are already formed in the body. And I can't give you Rogan at that point. It's over. The antibodies are already there. So that second baby will bleed out in utero. It will, it will, there will be a massive hemorrhage and it will die. Okay? So that woman will never be able to get pregnant again. So, and have a baby survive if she didn't get Rogan. So that's why it's so important. One of the reasons it's so important for prenatal care and so important to get Rogam if you're a negative blood type. That should, it's not even a question. You should not even have that as a question. Um, when I used to work in the blood bank, we had a um, mother who actually did not get Rogam and her second baby made it to term, but it was very, had theoretic disease in the uterus. And it's a yeah. I don't think it was yeah, well, if, if the new pregnancy was negative, though, it would be fine? Yes, it would be fine, but your chance, you've still got that chance. So, if the second one was RH negative, would the that, Yeah, that's what Lee was just saying, yeah. It, yeah, the second one happened to be negative, but you don't know that. And that's the scary part, you know, you don't know that. So, this one that I'm sending around, no, and that's one of the strangest things about it is that if you are positive, let's say you're A positive, even if your baby's negative, you don't have to have a because it, your body doesn't recognize the flip. Now, why that is, I don't know. It's just for women who have negative blood types. Is that why they used to make you do blood tests to get married? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, <clears throat> so this. This strip is a woman who came in at 42 weeks. Well, first off, that tells me that she's arch and late. She's gone 42 weeks. Now, we don't know her history. I don't know if she was not a somebody who came in and didn't get prenatal care. We don't know that. But they let her go too long, for one thing. Um, they came, she came in and they ruptured her membranes. They artificially ruptured it, and it's documented on here. And when the membranes were ruptured, it says fluid bloody some clots. So you know right there we got a problem, right? All right, we got a problem. Um, and then when they hooked them up to the tracing, you see these very deep decelerations. There's no variability at all. These are late decelerations. Um, so the patient presented at 42 weeks gestation for reduction, rupture of membranes revealed bloody amniotic fluid. Immediate C-section produced a hopelessly asphyxiated pale infant with a hematocrit of 10% who subsequently died. Um, examination of the maternal blood drawn before the operation revealed a large fetal maternal transfusion. And that's what they were talking about. That's what that means. Is that they just bleed. So it's very sad when those things occur. So if you're ever around somebody, especially if you know that they are a negative blood type, just say, there's you don't have a choice. You gotta go to the doctor. You just gotta go to the doctor. I don't care if it's their eighth child, they still need to go to the doctor. And every pregnancy, this is something else I want to say about the Rogam and make sure I, I, she may have told you this already, but Every pregnancy you get Rogam. That's not a one time and done thing. Every time you get pregnant, you get Rogam. Okay? Do you remember how, when you get it? 20 weeks. 20 weeks. Right. 20 to 28 weeks, somewhere around there, and then set within 72 hours after birth. I have a question. So, like, say that, like, like my brother and I are 11 years apart. So my mom got it, like whenever I was born, is she still protected for no, him? No, she still has to get pregnant. Every time. Every time you get pregnant, you get pregnant. I feel like it's the last one shot, done. Like the 72 hour shot would protect you right away. Yeah, that's what she If it's an early pregnant, if it's early, if you get pregnant immediately, it doesn't last. Okay, so if you're going to have, if you're... If you have the RH negative and you have a baby and then you get the one at 72 hours, do you still need the one at the 20 to 28 weeks? Yes. Okay. So you're Unless they get pregnant immediately. 
Yeah, yeah, if they get pregnant immediately, then they should be covered. But if it's a year or more, I think, yeah, you just don't get it. Oh, yeah, I would get it since baby. When it's me and it's your baby, heck, I'd be signing myself up. Can you overdose on it by getting the two people at once? It's not going to hurt you. It is a protective thing, right? And again, it's tricking, you're tricking your body, but we want to trick our body because we want it to. Okay? It's kind of a sad situation, but it's just some, at least, and this is why, you know, back in the early centuries, you know, babies died all the time. You know, you're, this is one of the reasons why, because they didn't know. Uh -huh. yeah. They gave you a every time, even before just regular surgeries. No, I like I had surgery. Oh, yeah. They gave you yep. every time. So, yeah. And let me tell you this too: Rogam is a blood product. It has to be signed out of the blood bank. It's like giving a trans. It's like going and getting a bag of blood for a transfusion. So what do you do? Mm. Good question. What did she ask? You run into a problem with your head sleep. So it's very good question. So they would just accept that no baby pray. Wow. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest ethical things that you're going to have. Um, the limits that you're going to have. And you know what you do? You give them all the information, and you say, "This is what could happen." And if they chose not to, do it. they realize the blood cream was blood You're supposed to tell them because it has to be signed. And they will actually carry a card. Stephanie, do you have a? You have. You should have a card. Do you have a card? No, I got it. Oh, okay, but you, you remember that little card they give you? Yeah, after every time you get rogue game, you get a little card that says, I'm RH negative, I have get, gotten rogue game, or I need rogue game. And they're supposed to, it's one of those things like if you're ever in a wreck and you're pregnant for some reason, they'll know in your pocketbook or whatever. So. Woo, Lord help. All right. Um, there's a picture in your PowerPoints of the different, um, it's like a picture from your book, early, late, variable deceleration, where the baby is, and it shows you some non-drawn out on the board pictures, or strips, if you want to look at that. <clears throat> All right. Um, what I was told just a second ago is that you all briefly went over a couple of the testings that are done. I don't, I want you to know more than just a brief little thing. So what I want to do is, while you're taking a break, I'm going to make a, a grid up on the board. And when you come back, we're going to hit some of those um, fetal tests because I really want you to know more than just a brief little overview. Okay with you guys? Mm -hmm. and, if, and, it's, and it'll be a review if, if you feel like you know it. But I just want to make sure that you get it. So, okay. So, let's take a good 10, almost 15 minute break so I can draw this up. Okay. Uh,